The Reverend Dr. Patricia Tull is an environmental theologian, the A.B. Rhodes Professor Emerita of Hebrew Bible at Louisville Presbyterian Seminary, and the author of Inhabiting Eden, um, Christians, the Bible, and the Ecological Crisis. She was formerly the program director uh, for Hoosier Interfaith Power and Light. She's taught and led earth care efforts um, among people of faith for the past 15 years. And she and her um, spouse, Don Summerfield, live in Henryville, Indiana, which we will hear more about in her presentation. So um, I'm just going to hand it over to Trisha now, and um, we're excited to, to hear from her. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, and I'm really happy to be with you all this afternoon and be sharing with you all. I see a lot of familiar faces and, and a lot of familiar names. So I'm really happy about that. Um, I'm hoping that we will have some time for discussion at the end. And as Jessica said, just put any uh, questions along the way in the chat box and we'll try to address them. When I did this presentation in January for another organization, the builder of our net zero home joined us. And today our home's designer, Ted Clifton is trying to be here with us. He's, he's trying to get on right now. And I know he will be able to answer questions on a much deeper level than I can. Let me see if, if he's here. Have y'all uh, caught sight of him yet? I have not seen him yet. Um, okay. Michelle. Um, I have not either. Um, Trisha, if you um, want to send him my email address, I can reach out to him to try to figure that out while you're while you're speaking. Okay, um, he's been texting me. Do you want me to send him a text number? Uh, yeah, uh, I will message it to you that you can share. Okay, okay we'll do. Um, let me just check and make sure he's not already on. I don't see him, um, but I will be introducing him uh, further on in the program. And, uh, and then, like I said, he is an expert designer and um, you'll get to see his work. And um, I think that will help things to fall into place a lot more. I'm not getting it from you, Jessica. Oh, you, oh is it in the chat box? Okay. Just a second, everybody. I'm gonna send this to him. And just welcome to folks who are still coming in. If you want to drop your name and your location into the chat box, we've got folks from all over the country and we're really glad to gather with you in this way today. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and um, start my PowerPoint. Can everybody see that? You see a PowerPoint slide? It has not come up yet, Tricia. Oh, okay, let me try. Oh, it's, it's beginning, hang on. Yes. Whoa, okay. All right, so um, what I wanna talk to you today about um, is um, climate healthy homes. And by this, I specifically mean not just that the homes benefit human envir and environmental health, but they are built or retrofitted to contribute much, much less to the problem of energy pollution to begin with. And I uh, obviously can't speak in a professional capacity. I'm speaking as a homeowner who happens to be an environmental advocate. And I, I think that even if even I can come to understand enough of this stuff to act on it, anyone can. So there are a lot of reasons to want an energy efficient home. Besides polluting less, it saves money, it's more comfortable, and it helps gain some independence from monopoly utilities. These all matter, but more than anything, this matters to me, and I'm sure it does to many of you, because of the urgent message coming from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change a couple of years ago. The IPCC is made up of thousands of climate scientists pooling their data worldwide. In a special report in 2018, they told us that to avoid the worst effects of climate change, we must limit our warming of the planet to 1.5 degrees Celsius, that is less than three degrees Fahrenheit. 
This is challenging since we've managed to make the planet one degree Celsius warmer already. And if we continue the present course, we will inevitably get to three degrees Celsius, five and a half degrees Fahrenheit, which may not sound like much, but it would be unprecedented in human history and disastrous. To limit our warming, they said, we must cut our greenhouse gas emissions in half by 2030, nine years from now, and then get to net zero by 2050. Net zero means not increasing atmospheric greenhouse gas at all. In other words, we need to step up the pace on renewable energy and draw down carbon. This means pulling on all the levers we can find, both large and small. There are several reasons why we might take climate change personally. Science says humans must do this for our survival. Ethicists say Americans should do this because our country has put more carbon per capita into the air than nearly any other country. Many people of faith want to do this out of respect for our creator and love for the earth, the poor and our children. For me personally, the way I show my gratitude for this wonderful earth and my commitment to leaving it as healthy as I found it is to do what I can. All that we have and are and ever were and ever hope to be are right here on this beautiful planet. As daunting as this challenge is, I'm hopeful that we can and will do this together. Solutions are evolving and are needed from top to bottom, from states and national governments, industries and congregations, to leadership by individuals and families. I'm involved in another group called Presbyterian Climate Advocates that some of you may have already heard of. We teach four week Zoom classes called Faith and the Climate Crisis, geared for people who are concerned about the uh, crisis and looking for ways to get involved, especially in policy advocacy. This is our homepage. As you can see on this graph, almost half of all greenhouse gases emissions relate to buildings. And some of these buildings belong to individuals like ourselves. I want to talk about what is indeed possible and what some families, including our own, have done, maybe some of yours. My, my hope is really practical, is that if you're thinking about remodeling, or replacing a furnace or adding a room or even building a home, you'll gain some ideas today that will inspire your planning. Or if you don't have such plans already, maybe you'll consider them. Even if the entire electrical system in the US does manage to become renewable, it will take a lot of power. And the private sector, that is us, we will need to become as efficient as we can be. And if our houses currently use natural gas or oil, we will also need eventually to convert to electric. And that's now doable and reasonable. I'm gonna begin in downtown Jeffersonville across the Ohio River from Louisville in the 100 year old house where our family used to live and where most of our children grew up. It was a lovely home, but as you can imagine, when we moved in, it was not energy efficient. By the time my spouse Don and I started thinking seriously about this, most of our six kids had gone off to college and beyond, but in the years that followed, every one of them came back to live with us for a time, sometimes with their families. Some of you who are grandparents may have experienced this already too. And we had other young adults live with us as well. Maintaining that big house with everyone coming and going meant we had to work hard to conserve energy. We began keeping spreadsheets of our electricity and gas use to know better what we were spending and why. Then we had an energy audit, including a blower door test to help us find and plug the leaks in walls, doors, and windows. The first recommendation coming from the energy audit was to better insulate the attic and blow cellulose insulation into all the empty gaps of the exterior walls. This was not as involved as I would have thought. It was a couple days work. It cost about $3,400 and we recouped some of that with a federal tax credit. It was the single largest change to our quality of life. We were more comfortable without a leaky house and it saved a lot of money in utility bills. After heating and cooling, water heaters cost the most energy in homes. 
Ours was old and inefficient and threatening to break. So we had a tankless water heater installed. It saved a lot of money because it only ran when we needed the hot water. We were able to get a federal tax credit that paid the difference between a traditional water heater and that one. The federal government still offers up to $500 in tax credits for energy efficiency in homes. And some utilities offer rebates as well. We went down the list to find what was available. We also paid attention to other rebates and discounts from the utilities, such as for light bulbs and switches. In 2008, when Hurricane Ike caused a windstorm that blew all the way here, we lost seven large trees. That was when we decided to remove the gas piping from the fireplace and install a Vermont Castings wood stove with a catalytic converter. It could heat about a third of the house on its own and as Don likes to say, it warmed him twice, once when he was chopping the wood and once when burning it. We've never once sacrificed a tree for it. It was always fallen trees or trees our neighbors decided to remove. So we started making one change per month in our old house. One month we put up a clothesline. Another month we installed CFL light bulbs and later LEDs. We weather stripped doors and windows. When we replaced appliances, we bought Energy Star or better. We bought a Nest thermostat that automatically set back the power at night when we were not at, or when we were not at home. We kept some room vents closed and supplemented with ceiling fans in summer. The idea was to heat and cool people, not rooms. And this presentation isn't about transportation, but we did buy a Prius and use our feet and bicycles much more often. And for what we couldn't eliminate, we bought energy offsets and green energy when possible. This chart of gas and electricity use from 2005 to 2017 shows our journey. The gas is in red, the electricity is in blue, and you can see that with some aberrations, we were able to cut our use significantly over the years. Annual use of both gas and electricity was cut by two thirds. Not 50% as the IPCC recommended, but 67% without that much effort in a large 100 year old house. We could have done some other things. We kept our HVAC system serviced, but we didn't replace it. That would have been a next step. We could have nagged our adult children more to wear seasonal clothing rather than changing the thermostat every time they walk through. But we couldn't install solar panels because we had too many trees, which of course is not a bad thing in summer. We did pretty well, but after I retired from the seminary to spend more time on environmental work, and after Don moved from being a pastor at the Presbyterian Church around the corner from us to what he calls his pre-tirement gig as halftime pastor at First Presbyterian in Scottsburg, Indiana, we saw an opportunity. For 13 years, we had owned acreage in Henryville, which is between Jeffersonville and Scottsburg. It had a pond, a dock, some fields, and some woods, but no buildings except an old truck bed for storage. In 2018, we decided to build a house there. We started researching how to get all the way to net zero energy, that is using no more energy on average than we can produce renewably. We came across this company in Coopville, Washington. The owner, Ted Clifton, has been a home builder and designer for 45 years. And I'm wondering, it, was he ever able to get on the program? Ted, are you here? Oh dear. Well, I'm hoping, I'm ho I'm hoping that he'll be here before the end because he knows so much um, and uh, can answer a lot of questions that I can't. Or if you want to uh, jot down the, the website, you can uh, ask him directly. Ted has a long list of certifications and awards, including being a seven time National Energy Value Housing Award winner and three time National Green Building Award winner. He designed Seattle's first true net zero energy home and works frequently with the Department of Energy receiving their award for housing innovation every year. So we knew we would be getting the best if we asked him to design our home for us. On Ted's homepage is a video I highly recommend outlining 12 steps to net zero. What stands out right away watching the video or even looking at this list 
is first that not many of these are easy to retrofit into an existing home. Second, the house operates as a whole system engineered for efficiency. And third, solar panels are the last thing on the list, not the first. I'll show you what he designed for us and how all these factors played out in our house. We really liked this house on Ted's website, but it was 2,700 square feet. I thought that was too big, so I asked him to shrink it to 2,300 square feet. Meanwhile, we interviewed custom home builders until we found the right one. Nick Romeo in Lanesville, that's the bald one in the picture, is one of the state's foremost builders of efficient homes. When Nick began talking with Ted about the plan, he realized that we'd be taking him and his crew to a new level. He called it going to school with us paying the tuition. He was glad to do it and so were we. The first time Nick visited our home site and saw how hilly it was, he recommended adding a walkout basement to our two-story plan. Basements, he said, are far cheap, cheaper per square foot than other floors, so why not? Especially since we'd need a safe room for tornadoes like the one that destroyed much of the town of Henryville eight years ago. So Ted added a basement, and then in all in all, the house ended up about the same size as our old house, but much better laid out. That big a house was not what I had in mind, but we recognized that the ongoing disadvantage of a large house is heating and cooling. And if it worked as it should, that would not be an issue. And by then, our, whoops, our immediate family had already doubled in size. And now it has grown to 13 adults and seven grandchildren, almost everyone who's in these pictures. Two days after we moved into our house, our kids started coming to stay with us. And that was what we had hoped for. We wanted to start grandma camp for our urban grandkids. So we were glad to start right away. When my Miami son, Ian was here last Christmas, he joked that when the apocalypse came, they'd be on our doorstep. Little did we know that the apocalypse was scheduled for 2020. One year ago, two months after his remark, when the schools Ian and his wife led went virtual, they and their daughter and unborn child drove up here and stayed for five months. In short, when you have six kids, even when they grow up, the chances are pretty good you're going to want the space. We first broke ground on a chilly morning in January 2018, and we moved in 18 months later at the end of July 2019 with time for several family visits and some infrastructure improvements before the pandemic began. Here's the house. I'm not gonna walk through it. You just have to come and visit us for that. And I hope you do. But I do want to outline how Ted's 12 essential steps to net zero played out in this house. First and third, building orientation and window placement. That obviously involves planning, but no additional cost if you're building a house. This, what you're seeing is the Southwest side with the basement walkout. And to the right, you can see the Southeast side. These are where most of our windows are. We put porches around these to keep out much of the hot summer sun while inviting in the winter sun when it's low on the horizon. The design makes the porches integral to the house and expands our indoor outdoor space. The northeast and northwest sides have fewer and smaller windows and don't need the porch. You'll notice that we have a breezeway connecting the house to a carport. That carport is at a 45 degree angle from the house with the driveway side facing due north and I'll show you why in a few minutes. In terms of simple design, Stacking the house to pack three floors under one roof means the footprint is not large. We put everything essential for daily life on the main floor, the middle one, and that meant a smaller living room, bedroom, and primary bathroom, along with laundry room, kitchen, and screen porch. We put Don's study upstairs with the guest bedroom and my study in the basement next to a den with a futon for more guests. If later we don't want to climb a lot of stairs, we won't have to. Thermal mass is not something most builders or homeowners think about, 
but the more mass there is absorbing heat in the daytime and radiating it overnight, the more the temperature inside remains stable. You can do that with stone or brick walls or tile floors. In our house, it's done with concrete under the oak floors in the basement and main floor. This serves another purpose I'll talk about in a minute. And unusually, the builders put insulation on the outside of the 10 inches of, of basement walls rather than inside to include their mass inside the building envelope. Which leads to the next factor, a tight envelope. Our designer Ted generally uses SIPs, that is structural insulated panels that are factory built and cut to specification. They're made of foam in the middle with OSB or plywood on either side. They can form the roof as well as the walls. So the home insulation is built right into the framing and there's very, there are very few seams. But Nick, our builder, wasn't familiar with SIPs and wanted to stick with traditional framing with spray foam insulation, which he had the workers to do. But he used two by six exterior wall and roof studs instead of conventional two by fours with insulation between all of them and Huber Zick panels on the exterior. This also meant having extra deep windowsills, which is great for plants. Tight walls are no good without tight windows. We got triple pane casement windows and doors that are very beautiful and lock like a submarine. They came in packing crates from Canada. So Don, ever the recycler, used all the crates to build shelving for our barn. When a house is very tight, ventilation is crucial. We installed a regular range hood, but added an exhaust fan on a variable speed controller with a timer. The fan is mounted on the outside of the house and is wired to a fan in the attic that draws air into the bedrooms and living areas whenever we turn on the kitchen fan. A timer allows us also to run this in the pre-dawn hours of summer to bring cool air into the house. Now for the heating and cooling system. Along with hot water, these use by far the most energy, even with great insulation and thermal mass. We have a closed loop ground source system, what many people call geothermal. There are various configurations, but ours is vertical, the one you see on the upper left corner. Water is pumped through the pipes in the ground beside the house. No matter what temperature the water is when it leaves the house, it re-enters at the constant ground temperature of 50, which the heat, heat pump can boost by 20 degrees rather than starting with the extremely variable air temperature, which is as low as 10 degrees or as high as 100 where we live. With a heat pump, you don't need natural gas at all. Our house is all electric. This highly efficient variable speed heat pump provides our hot water which is stored in this 85 gallon space capsule looking smart storage tank. I was surprised that we wouldn't have a tankless water heater, but this thing is said to save 80% on hot water energy use, which I don't think you can do with even the most efficient tankless heater. And our rural electric co-op gave us a $1,500 rebate for installing the ground source heat pump. And we got a federal tax credit for geothermal. The house's original design didn't call for any central ducting. Instead, efficient mini splits would provide the cooling. Unfortunately, and this is one of the limits, limitations in our area, the HVAC company wouldn't work with us unless we agreed to install a whole house air conditioning system. The downside was we ended up with a lot of duct work sending air into rooms we didn't always need to cool. The upside was that everything connected to the geothermal system it earned the 30% tax credit. So this heat pump also provides air conditioning. We almost never use the air heat from it because we also have this other heat pump. It uses the warmed water from the ground source loop to warm another series of water pipes that are embedded in the two concrete thermal mass floors. People think of in-floor radiant as being toasty to the touch, but it really isn't because our body temperature is much higher than we'd want our floors and rooms to be. 
but it's not cold either. For instance, standing on the bathroom tile. It's highly efficient because there are no fans and the heat simply rises from the floor into the rooms. Ours has three zones, the finished basement rooms and the primary bedroom area, both of which we can keep rather cool and the living area, which we keep a bit warmer. The second floor doesn't have or need radiant heat since the warm air rises to it from the open living area. We liked our old stove so much that we wanted to install a fireplace that is basically a built-in wood stove. It has an intake vent from outside and usually radiates enough warmth to keep the floor heat from turning on when it's burning. We designed the cabinets on either side to hold kindling and firewood. And we supplemented the cooling with 10 ceiling fans. These don't cool rooms. They do no good at all unless there are people for them to gently blow on, but they lower the felt temperature on your skin quite a bit. The large windows also allow us to cool with cross breezes, especially mornings and nights. And the wraparound and screen porches let us spend a lot of time outside, even when we're just drinking coffee or eating dinner. Number 10, the appliances. The appliances are extremely efficient. Energy Star does not have ratings for cooktops and ovens, but there are amazing efficiencies to our induction cooktop and convection wall oven. The cooktop not only heats faster than traditional electric cooktops, but also faster than gas, saving energy, and it cools down faster too. It's 90% efficient as opposed to 50 or 55% for gas and electric. The oven is actually two smaller ovens that fit into the footprint of a single one. So we only heat the space we need. These also are very quick to heat up. The dishwasher, which you can see the left side arrow pointing downward um, under the windows, that is Energy Star and amazingly quiet. And right to the right of it is a microwave drawer made by Sharp. You push a button and it rolls out. I love it because I'm short and it's low. Microwaves are in general really efficient. The fridge and clothes washer are of course Energy Star as well. The clothes dryer is a single appliance within the house that draws the most electricity, but it doesn't run long because the washer spins so, much, so well. Even so, we did install a clothesline and we still use it. When the sun is shining, and even when it's not, the windows are pretty sunny and we don't turn on many lights in the daytime. But for nights, every light in the house is LED, which are many times more efficient than incandescent and last 25 times longer without wasting energy putting out heat. We have only three finished room, uh, rooms that don't have windows and all of them are bathrooms. Two of these have solar tube skylights that bring the sun down from the roof in the daytime and collect power in small solar panels. So at night, they're like moonlight. Last but not least, on the essential steps to energy efficiency, we have a rooftop solar system from Solar Energy Solutions in Kentucky. That's what the south facing roof of the carport is for. This carport was built to the solar in installer specifications in direction, size, and roof pitch. And because the carport and breeze bay, breezeway were built to hold the panels, they were eligible for the federal tax credit along with the rest of the solar system, which in 2019 was 30% and now is 26%. We have 26 300 watt panels in full sun. All but two are at 812 pitch, about 33 degrees. Each panel has a micro inverter maximizing its efficiency and they are connected to an inverter, which turns the DC panel into AC so our house can use it, and a Tesla Powerwall battery, which stores 13 and a half kilowatt hours of energy generated in the daytime so that we can use it overnight. We can also send excess power out to the grid, and we do, but since we're on a rural electric co-op that doesn't offer net metering, we are charged three times as much as we are credited for the power we produce. So we like to send out as little as possible and store what we can in the battery. It also serves as a backup power source the way a generator would. 
In the past four months, the grid has gone down eight times, once for 45 minutes, and it made us no difference at all. The appliance that uses the most power of all is this um, Clipper Creek 240 volt charger in the carport that charges my electric Chevy Bolt. So I charge on sunny days when the energy would otherwise be going back to the grid. And inside that doorway, you can see Don's electric assist bike, which is also powered by the solar panels. And we have a posse of electric yard and garden equipment. A Tesla app monitors our power generation and use. The screenshot on the left is from Wednesday, January 13th, middle of winter. Since the previous day was cloudy, we started the day with an empty battery. So the whitish blue shows that the grid supplied our electricity until sunrise around eight. The spiking lines show the in-floor radiant heat kicking on and off through the cold night. The yellow shows the solar power generation, which on that sunny but short day was 34 kilowatt hours. The blue shows our home's energy use. The large blue tower in the middle is my car charging. The green shows storage in the battery below the baseline and use of the battery above it. You can see that the battery helped with the car and then took over when the sun went down. And that evening the heat stayed off because the sun had warmed the house. Much more satisfying is a day like last November 12th, the graph in the middle. We're getting back to this now in March. Even though the overnight temperature was 35, we had a lot of sun. We generated 41 kilowatt hours and the house used less than 14. We filled up the battery and sent most of the power to the grid, which earned us a whopping 96 cents and also the encouragement of knowing our neighbors were using renewable energy. Last, the image on the right shows why going off grid would be difficult if you didn't want to rough it. It was just two days before the sunny day on the left, but it was quite cloudy and cool and we only generated a little solar energy, not even enough for heating on a day like that. Here is our 2020 power generated in blue and power used in red. You see the power that we generate peaks during the longest days in June and July and falls quite a bit in winter. The power we use, of course, peaks in winter and summer with heating and cooling. Most months, the blue line stays above the red one, which is what we want, but not in the winter. If we had net metering, or if we simply wanted to generate as much on average as we used all year without regard to cost, we could do without the battery. But with the battery, we save money, not having to buy back our own power for three times as much every night. And I can charge my car with 100% solar, which matters to me living 20 miles from town. Speaking of electric cars, here is a recent New York Times article. I know the graph is too small to read, but what it shows is the comparative cost over the life of various cars. Gas powered cars in gray at the top most expensive, diesel cars in green, hybrids and plug-in hybrids in pink and electric cars in yellow. The price of EVs is falling as we have all heard. Maintenance cost is low because there's no engine and few moving parts and charging is a whole lot cheaper than gasoline. And they have awesome pickup, so they're fun to drive. So all in all, in the year 2020, when we were intensively cooking and working from home, and had three extra people for nearly half the year with the AC cranked up through the hot summer for our pregnant daughter-in-law. With all that, we used only 519 more kilowatt hours than we generated, which is about like keeping one standard incandescent bulb on. Without the car, it would have been flipped around and we would have generated more than 2000 kilowatt hours more than we used. In other words, getting to fully renewable energy in the house took not 30 years, but the one year of building time. We did what we could to try to minimize the recyclable or reusable material that would otherwise have gone into the builder's dumpster. We grabbed pallets, scrap trim and lumber, 
boxes, extra wires, stray nails, everything that we could either reuse or recycle to keep it from the waste stream. One thing we didn't have the expertise or resources to pull off very well was to find ways to assure that the building materials were eco-friendly. We did try to source our stone fairly locally and used natural products as much as possible. I was really impressed recently by a presentation about the Phipps Conservatory in Pittsburgh, which has won all kinds of sustainability awards. They talked about having charrettes, meetings where everyone involved talked together during the design phase to make sure they were on the same page in terms of goals. They also found and consulted the Living Future Institute's living building lists for materials to use and avoid. I can't even pronounce most of the chemicals on their avoid list. In terms of cost, in our old house recycled from the early 20th century, we knew how much we paid for improvements that brought our power use down by two thirds. We more than recouped what we invested. And since one of our daughters and her family are living there now, they continue to reap those benefits. Since the efficiencies in the new house were all rolled into the overall cost, we don't have an exact figure for those. And although we couldn't have lived here without building a house, we do have to ask what the environmental footprint was of having the trucks rolling in every day and the concrete and the wood and the stone. But that would have happened building an inefficient house. In fact, we regularly hear from our builder about other homes being built nearly nearby that cost much more, not for efficiency, but for gargantuan rooms, bathroom spas, pricey trim and other things with no monetary payback. Just as a ballpark, According to several experts, the extra layout for energy efficient buildings is around 10%, 10%, which is recouped over time and continues to benefit in lower utility costs over the home's life. Energy efficiency is not just for people with deep pockets though. Habitat for Humanity is building and retrofitting some net zero and net positive energy homes for low income people. Here is one built 16 years ago in Colorado. It doesn't even include some of the technologies available today, but it still produces 25% more than it uses. The upfront costs are somewhat higher for insulation, better appliances and solar panels, but the savings over the years of ownership more than make up for that. Here's a more recent Habitat house in North Carolina that won a Department of Housing Innovation Award it's DOE Zero Energy Ready Certified, Energy Star Certified, and Indoor Air Plus Certified. It's all electric with a heat pump water heater and ductless mini spit splits, those things that I wanted. Even without solar, its utility cost is $300 per year cheaper than the same size standard house. And now if we had the time, I'd show you all about what else we do with our gardens and our land and um, trying to, to um, be not only sustainable, but regenerative in our gardening. But I'll just show you some pictures for now. We do lots of vegetables and herbs and fruits. We have a greenhouse and also a root cellar, some tropical fruits, a seeding, seedling starting station right next to the Tesla battery, and a small aquaponics setup. We have birds and wildlife cover and native trees and it all keeps us very entertained. So um, I'm hoping uh, and trusting that we have some time for discussion now. I'm going to stop sharing so we can see each other face to face and you all can uh, 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 put on your video if you like and unmute yourself if you wanna um, say something and um, and I'm wondering now if um, if Ted. So I I was able to get him on the phone, and so now we're trying to see. Um, uh, Ted, can you unmute yourself to speak with us? Um, I know that he's been able to hear you. Okay. That's too bad. Um, he couldn't get he on. He just unmuted, it looks like. Okay. Hey, Ted, are you there? Uh, 
Well, in any case, it looks like we have some questions. So, um, uh, Jessica, do you want to um, curate um, those? Sure. Um, I the first question that I see um, was sent to me, and there's a question about why you chose to have the carport instead of a closed in garage. It looks like maybe you have both, but could you speak to your yeah. decision? Yeah, um, the the main reason uh, there were there were a couple of reasons, and we went around and around about it a little bit. Um, but the main reason was because we could build the carport and get a thirty percent tax credit from as as it being part of the solar installation, which we couldn't do with a garage because the garage would also have the other purpose of uh, being a house for the cars. So. Um, a carport will will generate that tax credit. And so that's what we decided to do. And it's really worked out nicely um, with all kinds of, of uh, benefits that we wouldn't have thought of, um, such as we can pull the cars out of it and use it for, we've used it for a barbecue space when it's been raining. And um, we see it as a pretty good party space. And also um, we can do some projects under a roof, but outside uh, in that space. We, we don't have a garage, but we do have um, a 30 by 40 uh, foot barn that we keep the tractor and, and other equipment in. And it's a ways, a little ways off from the house. Hope that answers the question. Um, the next question that I saw was from Steve and it the question is just what about wind power for a home? Um, I'm not sure, Steve, if you're still on, if you'd like to um, expound any more on that as a question, um, or if you have anything you want to say about that, Tricia? I'm um, sure. Yeah, I wanted. I looked into wind power, and um, and it's totally dependent on where you are. And um, in northern Indiana, uh, far north of us, uh, wind power is is used quite a bit, especially on a utility scale. Uh, but it's the wind doesn't gr blow hard enough, um, long enough in the year for us here to use it very well. I, I saw a house in Louisville that had both solar and wind on it. And, and I wish I knew the owners or had the audacity to go knock on the door and find out how well it worked. Um, but we, it, it's, it's really, um, you need a good um, installer who can give you a, a sense of um, how much is going to benefit you for how much it's going to cost. Yeah, this is Steve. I'm the one to ask the question. Sure. Uh, I knew there were some crazy regulations several years back where if you, and I, this was in Illinois, if you installed a, a windmill or wind for wind power, it had to be so many feet high, not too high, not too low, and there couldn't be anybody next door in case it fell over. It seemed like the restrictions were kind of designed to keep wind power out of the area. And I didn't know if, if people for, you know, environmental reasons like birds, you know, didn't do it. Haven't seen a lot around. I'm in Galveston Island, so, you know, we always have enough wind, but I don't see any on the island. Yeah, um, there, I've been listening to some fantastic podcasts, um, uh, and um, one of them led me to a book um, that's about, it's, it's the book is entitled, it's a new book called Short Circuiting Policy, and it deals with um, uh, state regulations that have been put forth to try to stop renewable energy, and deals specifically, and this will be of interest to you probably, it deals specifically with Texas, as well as Ohio, Arizona, and um, uh, Ohio, Arizona, Texas, and one other state, I forget which. Um, but it's, it, you know, there is a, a crazy morass of, of regulation trying to choke, put a chokehold on um, renewable energy, especially um, uh, owner generated energy. And um, that's, that's, that's really discouraging. But as the, as the um, price of wind and solar have fallen, that's, it's been a lot um, harder to argue that fossil fuels are the, are the future. 
Um, in terms of birds, you hear that all the time. Um, I was caught short by it by somebody one time um, who just said, oh, they kill birds. But if you look at the statistics on that, they have in the past killed birds and they do kill a certain number of birds every year. Uh, but um, installers of wind, uh, wind uh, farms have gotten smarter in terms of not putting them in migratory paths. That's the start. And, um, and uh, also one of the, the um, one thing I, I heard was if you paint one of the blades brown, then the birds are much more likely to spot it, like three times more likely to spot it and avoid it. Um, and, um, and then you have to also compare that with the number of birds that are killed by um, the fossil fuel industry uh, in all its forms, by building windows, by birds, which is by far the largest killer of birds. So uh, it's kind of a, it's, you know, I think it's a, a false argument. I find the wind, wind generators really beautiful. Um, there's been uh, more and more going on offshore on the East Coast, especially up in uh, around New England. And I think we're going to be, I'm, I'm hoping that we're going to be seeing more of that wind generation. Um, Ted, are you, it looks like you're unmuted. Are you, are you able to speak now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. This thing keeps telling me I'm unmuted and then somehow it mutes me again. So, uh, wow. yeah, just a final comment on the wind discussion there. Uh, generally speaking, wind is so much more cost effective when it's done on a utility scale by a really large wind generator. You have to spend so much on a tower to get up above, you know, in rough numbers, you need to be at least 40 feet above any trees or houses or other things around you. And so you're typically looking at a hundred foot tall tower and the engineering on that gets so expensive for the relatively small wind turbine that you'd want to put in on a residential scale that it, it just isn't cost effective that way. But the utility scale wind turbines are the cheapest way of producing electricity right now. So. So that's why you see so many of those popping up. Um, let's see, a comment on the overall regulation si situation that we have. We really desperately need a national bill of rights for small solar producers. Uh, we, the people, really need to take over the utility industry again. Uh, roughly 100 years ago, we were so anxious to be able to get power to our houses and businesses that we basically as a nation gave away the rights to produce power to the large power companies who would spend their own money to get um, power to us, but they were guaranteed a certain profit. And those power laws still exist and they're on the books today. And so we've, we've given monopolies that are virtually perpetual and it's time to go take those back. We have the same issue with water rights and various other things that were done 150 to 200 years ago in some cases, and the laws on the books no longer make any sense. Yeah, I think um, if, if we're okay, there's another question. Um, I don't know uh, if Ted might comment on this too, but um, why did you not build an eight inch or a or even 12 inch walls and roof as super insulation since your goal was to maximize your HVAC efficiency. Ted, I think um, yeah, I'd like you, you can want me to that take that? Yeah. yeah. So more insulation will prevent more heat loss, but you hit a sort of a point of no return when it comes to the cost effectiveness of it. So we're doing zero energy houses in Northern British Columbia, just below the Arctic Circle, where we are using uh, either eight inch or 10 inch or 12 inch walls, the farther north we go and up to 15 inch SIPs roofs. You need it in those climates to get the heating cost down to a, a level that we can get to zero over the course of the year. Uh, in Indiana, uh, the optimal 
you know, I, I weigh everything between what does it cost to heat it versus what does it cost for more solar panels to pay for the heat? And if I can put less money into the installation by buying one more solar panel and save a thousand dollars by doing it, then that's what I'm going to do. It's all about doing the math and understanding how much heat you can lose and then replace as opposed to just trying not to lose it. You're still going to need a heating system anyway. So uh, it's, it's optimizing that cash flow. I saw a question in here about what dishwasher we have. Um, we went with all uh, General Electric appliances. And the reason was because they were the ones that had the induction cooktop that I wanted and the double single, uh, they call it a twin flex oven that I wanted. And uh, GE is, is um, also local to Louisville. Um, so we just went ahead and, and went with all GE appliances. And um, I was trying to see if I could quickly pull up the exact model of the dishwasher, uh, but I wasn't able to do that. If you want to uh, email me, I can look it up. Those um, models change from year to year. So when you're true. shopping for appliances, look at the uh, Energy Star label on them. It'll tell you how many kilowatts of energy it uses over the course of a year. And just compare them from brand to brand and, and model to model. Because even within Energy Star units, you might find one that uses five or 10% less energy than another one that's also Energy Star. So all the brands have some good models. Just do your homework on, on those Energy Star labels. Mm -hmm. And you can do well to mix and match and, and get different brands um, for. Um, Whatever you whatever you find that's going to work the best, um, Carla. Um, hi, Carla. Um, said as the owner of a 100 year old house in Ohio, I appreciate your discussion of how to work within the constraints of an existing structure. Did you have concerns about condensation buildup and leading to mold issues with blowing in the insulation to the walls of your historic home? Um, we did have a concern that didn't end up being a problem. We did have to run a dehumidifier in the basement, and that wasn't so much because of the insulation as it was just because it was an underground basement a block away from the Ohio River, and it's just very damp there. Um, so we did we did have to uh, do that. And we also had to do a lot of, of work to, to keep the dampness out of out of our basement. Um, so, um, but the the insulation itself. Um, you know, I thought it sounded like a drastic thing to do. It was it was easy because it was a clabbered house. We, they could pull um, one a board off of uh, the um, each floor all the way around and blow the insulation in from the outside from a from a truck, and uh, and then re replace the board and they were done. It worked really well. Um, someone sent me a, a question about, do you have solar panels on your greenhouse for starting plants in the winter? No, um, what we do on the greenhouse, we have, um, we, I saw somebody ask what, uh, how many panels we have. We have 26 panels, um, 24 of them are on the carport and two are on the um, breezeway. The two on the breezeway are just so that we could get the credit for that too. Um, but uh, we don't, we have um, the greenhouse is glass on the sides and um, some kind of poly uh, semi, semi transparent material on the, on the roof. And the way it, and it's only single pane glass. So it's very um, subject to the heat and the cold um, of the seasons. But what we did to try to minimize the, the co cooling at night was a few things. We, the, the north wall of the greenhouse is all stone. Um, so that acts as a thermal mass for us. And we have a stone knee wall all the way around. And um, then we put four um, rain barrels inside of it, filled them with water. And uh, water is a really super good thermal mass. And we could see immediately the difference once we filled those with water. 
um, that helped regulate the temperature some more. And then finally, it, it was going to get down to 10 degrees here at a certain point last month for several days. And I had a lot of uh, lettuce and greens that I didn't want to have freeze. So we ended up rigging up a system of um, pipes and pipe tape um, uh, running through the, the gardens. And the pipes were filled with water and the pipe tape kept it uh, kept the water warm. And between that and putting row covers over the plants, um, they stayed just very comfortable, cool, but comfortable. And now our biggest problem, um, and I think it's gonna be even more so as we go through the season, is how to keep it cool enough in there. Um, I've already got the screen, screen door open and um, we have a fan running, but um, it, it's, it's all a new experience for us. Um, trying to uh, see how the greenhouse works. And, and so far it's been a fantastic experience. We love it. Um, so I wanna jump in quickly to say we are recording and we will share the link with everyone um, once we have it uploaded online. Um, we are at four o'clock. And so if you need to go, we want to honor that. But Trisha has said she can hang around a little bit longer to answer a few more questions. Um, but if you need to go, we understand that. Um, one of the questions that I saw um, uh, was about, um, could Ted talk about the importance of siding and sun angles? So if you have anything related to that, um, that you'd like to speak to for... Certainly, uh, yeah, I don't know if you had specific questions about siding. Siding. Uh, most of our home. Pardon, siding. With a T. Yes, with a T, oh, sorry. Siding. Siding. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, if generally we try to get the house facing south, but in this case, because of where views were, uh, we turned the house to a 45 degree angle. So we had in a way two, two faces of the house facing south, one southwest, one southeast. Um, and we knew that we were gonna be able to do that solar garage or carport uh, to be faced due south for the solar panels. So then we just worried with the house about optimizing everything for the actual sun angles. Uh, so while it's unusual to do the 45 degree angle, it's certainly not unheard of. Uh, my construction company is Clifton View Homes. So View is my middle name. And, and typically when you buy a piece of property, it's often because you like the view, uh, especially rural properties, mountain properties, lakefront, waterfront. So optimizing the view and still making it work for both passive and active solar is uh, a little bit of an art, but it's what we do. So uh, start with what is real. That is the land you're building on. And then we work with what is available. Mm -hmm. And we wanted, the, we wanted that particular angle of view ourselves. So we just told him that's what we wanted. And we wanted two sides that were going to be, um, you know, the, the window sides. Facing, facing the lake and facing the woods. So there's a, a question about uh, the solar panels, uh, where they came from. So I'm looking that up. If anybody wants to uh, say something else while I'm doing that, feel free. Here we go. Um, they were Trina's. I'm not sure where they're from. And, and a solar, solar edge, um, um, inverter, Trina solar panels. Yeah, I believe the solar edge is, is made in the US. Uh, the Trina I haven't heard of, but there are solar panels made all over the world, including in the US. And uh, we are usually in most of our homes using uh, solar panels that are at least assembled in the US because the companies have figured out that it's uh, cost effective to do that uh, because of various, you know, tariffs on importing finished products and things like that. So, uh, so most of the solar panels we're buying today are are assembled in the U.S. Most of the chips are made in the U.S. Uh, you know, uh, so there are Chinese components in many of them, but uh, uh, 
it's mostly U.S. product today. So I I think that looks like we got all of the questions. Um, I don't know if if any um, if either of you have any last words you'd like to share with folks before we go. Um, but we've really appreciated um, all of all of the wisdom that you've shared with us for sure today, and just about your experience. It's been really great um, to see. Well, I am so appreciative of of Ted. Um, for his support and help all the way through this whole project and the ingenious way that he put this house together. And I'm, I'm also very grateful that he was able to come and, and share today in this program. And I do recommend that if you have interest or you know anybody who has interest in, in building a home, whether large or small, he does both, um, that you uh, take a look at his website and see what kinds of uh, homes he designs. Um, obviously, he doesn't build them all over the country, but he does design them for everywhere in the country. And um, uh, I think, I hope that we're going to see more and more of that happening. And uh, I hope that um, some of you here will also be pace setters for um, energy efficiency in your homes, as well as um, the good environmental work that you do and advocacy and action uh, that everybody here is carrying out. So thank you all so much for the opportunity to, to share with you this afternoon and, and do um, uh, contact me uh, if you have other questions. Um, and in the follow-up email that I send with the link to the video, I will get uh, Ted's website from Tricia and I will share that as well as her email address so that you will have that all together to reach out to her if you'd like. So thank you all so much for being with us today. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you.